Hello, Robert Bastian here from Bastian Voice Institute and Laryngopedia. My subject is what if Botox doesn't work for RCPD, retrograde cricopharyngeus dysfunction? Here's the scenario for those who don't know uh, about RCPD. This, the scenario is uh, that the person usually lifelong can't burp or can't burp enough. Some have sa say they never ever have burped to their memory and others say uh, they can get little micro burps here and there but they're not satisfactory. They, they don't provide relief of the other terrible symptoms. There's gurgling. Uh, it's usually from somewhere up in here more than the belly. There's this gurgling noise. Sometimes they sense it internally and most often people around them can hear it, uh, some a few feet away and some people down, uh, across a, la a large room you can hear the gurgling. It's, it's uh, socially awkward and uh, distressing. Gurgling, uh, bloating, uh, and we think of bloating as being an abdominal symptom but there are, are that's very common and the abdominal bloating is often associated with distension as well. We use pregnancy as an analogy. Most people say by the end of the day they're sort of three, four months pregnant, some say six, and a few say nine or 11. So the abdomen can really blow up tremendously with extra, extra air that should have been burped out. Uh, but there are also a lot of people with chest and, and low neck pressure and symptoms. So can't burp, gurgling, bloating, and flatulence is usually world-class uh, gold medal. I don't know anybody who, can, who has as much gas as I do. And basically people are inflating throughout the day and then they deflate after meals, evening, and even through the night while they're sleeping. And then there's a whole list of other symptoms that are really common but not quite as universal. Uh, painful hiccups, a feeling of shortness of breath, like there's no room to take a deep breath because they're so, so full. Uh, nausea after eating. Some people uh, have to eat very small amounts because of the nausea. Hypersalivation, uh, meaning mouth is drooling, sort of like when you're going to throw up, that kind of thing. Constipation is definitely a part of our CPD in some people. Some people even have autonomic symptoms where the heart rate goes up and they feel flushed and, and things like that. So there's the syndrome, and the treatment is Botox injection into the sphincter. The sphincter is right here. Uh, here you see it in the model. Um, there's a, it's a gateway muscle between the lower throat and the esophagus, this being the airway and where the vocal cords live, and this back here being the foodway. It's a collapsed muscular tube, and that sphincter Ha, sits contracted at all times except at the moment that you swallow a saliva or food or liquid. It, it opens transiently and then clamps shut and it needs to do the same in the reverse direction and that's where the trouble comes. Well, Botox into this muscle is uh, remarkably uh, helpful. It validates the diagnosis but it also treats it uh, for the duration of the Botox in basically everybody and then four out of five, even after the Botox is worn off, they still can burp. So it's a, it's a permanent fix. We can go through the mouth like this, and I, it's still my preferred method, especially for people who come from a great distance. We're at 50 states and 26 countries in, in 2024, and so I like the idea of having actually seen the muscle and I know for sure that the Botox was delivered exactly where I want. But I've also published the EMG method, uh, which is to come through the neck, and I've done many of those, uh, and it works very well time after time, except when it doesn't. And I have, think I've had one miss, a fellow from Denver. Uh, and I warned him, I said, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at it, but I don't know that I can guarantee you that I'm really going to get you the, so he came back and we did it through the mouth and he's done great ever since. So those are the two methods. So then the question is, what happens if we do that? We identify the diagnosis, prima facie, on the face of it, uh, from the syndrome, not from any testing, and uh, we 
are sure of the diagnosis, we do the treatment, and um, the person calls back in two days and five days and seven days and 10 days and they say it didn't work, I'm not burping. Um, what's the explanation? And, and I would say in our caseload that is absolutely almost rare is, is the uh, word that I think we should use. But we have encountered people from other places where they say I went and did it and nothing happened. Well, what are the interpretations? Uh, somebody out there might say, well, maybe the diagnosis was wrong, and I would say, no, not, uh, not going to go there. I'm happy to be unsure, but when a person says, I can't burp, gurgling, bloating, flatulence, and then maybe some of the other symptoms, the diagnosis is extremely secure. So I don't think it's a, a problem of diagnosis. And furthermore, they didn't burp, they still don't burp, so we know for sure that, that uh, it, it doesn't dispel the diagnosis because they never got to burp. So second interpretation is that they're unusually insensitive to Botox. In other sites, I do a lot of Botox in the larynx for a, a different disorder, and we know that the dose varies by a factor of 10 at least, actually more than that. And so it could be that the dose needs to be bigger, but usually those people will say, I did some burping, but I didn't burp really well, and it went away pretty quickly. It was great for, a few weeks or, or whatever. So we're talking about people where it just didn't work at all. So not likely if, if at least 50 units was given, and we do 50, 75, and, and 100, currently at 100. Um, so, uh, and by the way, why do we do so much? We are really over-treating a lot of people. Uh, my first 200 were 50 units, my next probably six or 700 were 75 units. Great results in that entire large group of people over and over and over again, but there would be the occasional person where it seemed a little underpowered. And so I decided maybe 100 people ago to go to 100 units, knowing that I am significantly over-treating a lot of people. But of course, I don't know who those people are. So I figure, okay, we'll just over-treat a few more people to try to capture that small number of people who actually need the high dose. Um, so the other uh, potential explanation is targeting. And I think that's the most likely culprit. And I want to show you some pictures so that you see what I mean by that. Well, here's the intraoperative view, and I'm showing you the muscle in the, the very top of the esophagus. This is the esophagus below, and you notice how dilated it, it is, a maximum dilation distally. So this muscle is very easy to see, and this is a fairly typical view. And so we can inject that muscle quite easily and leave the operating room feeling completely secure that we, we uh, hit the target. But then there's the one where we have to use a really small scope because they have no jaw, they have huge teeth, they can't open the mouth very much, and so I'm using, I'm sort of working through a pea shooter, and every now and again I'm working with one eye. I, I can't even get binocular vision through the scope. And so that introduces, although I think we do very well, but it just shows you that targeting isn't the very same in every case. So the, the difficult anatomy, uh, and here's someone who's beginning to show a lot of redundancy. Do you see the wrinkles here? And so now it's becoming a little bit harder to decide exactly where is the muscle. It happens to be from about here to here, but you could get too, too deep down here uh, or too superficial if the muscle, if this mucosa is really quite thick. <coughs> and you determine that partly by palpating. You can see my little instrument right here and you can reach in and palpate and touch the muscle and sort of figure out <coughs> where it is. That becomes even more important in someone like this. This is someone with a great deal of redundancy, and I've drawn lines here to show you kind of where the muscle is. Look how much mucosa is uh, over top of it. It's like one of those dogs, what do they call it? Is it a Sharpe that has the <coughs> really abundant coat that's too big for it? It's that sort of an idea, or I sometimes say it's like uh, injecting through a billowing shower curtain. Um, you have to do more three-dimensional visualization and palpation 
uh, as compared to the very first one that I showed you. So the strategy then, uh, if you are someone who has had an injection done and it just didn't work, um, the strategy is to find out, you know, was I difficult? And if the surgeon says, yes, you were very difficult, um, meaning redundancy of the mucosa or hard, hard jaw, tooth anatomy, you could consider going to the EMG method. Um, that would be one strategy. Try again, uh, maybe if your surgeon was someone who hasn't really done it. Um, actually, you could find a lot of doctors who haven't done it who could do this very well for you if they are uh, experienced with the muscle for a different condition, a swallowing condition. They should be very good at this for you. Uh, and in the OR, I know there's a cost difference. It's about 4,000 total the, from beginning to end. It's about 4,000 for everything in the operating room and the EMG is about half that cost. So you could do the, the EMG or, or change the strategy. If you did the EMG and it didn't work, then do the OR and vice versa. You try a higher dose uh, and that's the, that's the strategy. So when Botox doesn't work, um, that's just to give you some ideas about why that might be. So keep trying, don't give up. It's a terrible disorder and you need relief. And I hope that gives you a little help. Thanks for listening.